So uh, this is my last talk, and um, as I said, you may already have been wondering about uh, what my real views on some re religious and spiritual matters are. Um, I discussed in the first lecture the evolution of human spirituality, and I, I argued that the invention of the soul was a turning point in the history of our species. And then uh, yes, yesterday I, I talked a bit about nature worship and even about how that could actually have a positive effect on, on, on our health, um, at least and belief in God could do. So today I'm going to um, say some, take a rather different line about the negative effects of religion um, because I think it's very important to, in our contemporary world to, to realize um, the possible uh, 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 very, um, difficult circumstances which are created by people's fundamentalist faiths. Um, and I may say I'm, I'm not the first to have my own affirmation of spirituality mistaken for belief in religion. Um, I quoted R Rupert Brooke in the first lecture, a letter to a friend, and um, here's some more of that letter. Uh, he writes to his friend, his, the remedy for depression, his friend was very depressed and that's why uh, Brooke was writing to him, the remedy is mysticism or life. I'm not sure which. Don't leap or turn pale at the word mysticism. I do not mean any relig religious thing or any form of belief. I still burn and torture Christians daily. <laughs> uh, well, I don't go quite that far. Um, but I do think that while spirituality is life-enhancing, organized religion, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Islam or whatever else we, uh, th there is out there, um, that can be deadening. And that's what I want to talk about today. This is the one lecture that I think Samuel Puddendorf might have appreciated, both because of his uh, deep interest in human rights, um, but also because I gather he had no time for dogmatic theology. He was, of course, a Christian um, and was originally intended for the priesthood, like his father had been, but um, he, in fact, didn't join the priesthood because he actually found uh, the dogmatism of the church all too much for him. Um, so at least though he wouldn't have agreed with all the sentiments, I think he'd have understood why, where I'm coming from. The lecture is one, it's based on a lecture I gave a few years ago for Amnesty International. It was an annual lecture in England, in Oxford. Um, and uh, although uh, I've brought it up to date and I've, I've illustrated it, uh, the, the pictures weren't there to begin with, it's, I, the, some of the references are a few years old, but I think, unfortunately, not very much has changed. I mean, I wish I could say it had. Okay. Um, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's how the English proverb goes. And since, like most proverbs, this one captures at least part of the truth, surely it makes sense that Amnesty International should have, dev should have devoted most of its efforts to protecting people from the menace of sticks and stones, not of words. Worrying about words must have seemed something of a luxury. But still, this proverb, like most proverbs, is also in part obviously false. The fact is that words can hurt. For a start, they can hurt people indirectly by inciting others to hurt them. A crusade preached by a pope, for example, racist propaganda from the Nazis, malevolent, malevolent gossip from a rival. And they can hurt people not so indirectly by inciting them to take actions that harm themselves. The lies of a false prophet, the blackmail of a bully the flattery of a seducer. And words can hurt directly, too. The lash of a malicious tongue, the dreaded message carried by a telegram, the spiteful on onslaught that makes the hearer beg his tormentor to say no more. Sometimes, indeed, words can kill outright. There's a story by the philosopher Christi Ch Christopher Chernyak about a deadly word virus that appeared one night on a computer screen. It took the form of a brain teaser, a riddle, so paradoxical that it fatally twisted the mind of anyone who heard, it, heard or read it, making them fall into an irreversible coma. Well, that's a fiction, of course, but it's a fiction with some horrible parallels in the real world. There have been all too many examples, historically, of how words can take possession of a person's mind, destroying his will to live. Think, for example, of so-called voodoo death, uh, the witch doctor has only to cast his spell of death upon a man, and without, within hours, the victim will collapse and die. Or, on a larger and more dreadful scale, think of the mass suicide at Jonestown uh, in Guyana in 1972. 
The cult leader, Jim Jones, had only to plant, plant certain crazed ideas in the heads of his disciples, and at his signal, 900 of them willingly drank cyanide. Words will never hurt me. The truth may rather be that words have a unique power to hurt. And if, it, if we were to make an inventory of the man-made causes of human misery, it would be words, not sticks and stones, that head the list. Even guns and high explosives might be considered playthings by comparison. Vladimir Mayakovsky uh, in, wrote in his poem, I, On the pavement of my trampled soul, the souls of madmen stamped the print of rude, crude words. So should we then be fighting amnesty's battle on that front too? Should we be campaigning for the rights of human beings to be protected from verbal oppression and manipulation? Do we indeed need word laws, just as all civilized societies have gun laws, licensing who should be allowed to use them in what circumstances? Should there be Geneva Protocols establishing what kinds of speech act count as crimes against humanity? No, I think the answer is obviously no. Uh, don't even think of it. Freedom of speech is too precious a freedom to be meddled with. And however painful some of its consequences may sometimes be for some people, we should still, as a matter of principle, resist putting curbs on speech. By all means, we should try to make up for the harm that other people's words do, but not by censoring the words as such. <clears throat> and since I'm so sure of that in general, and since I'd expect most of you to be so too, I'll probably shock you when I say that it's the purpose of my lecture today to argue in one particular area just the opposite. <clears throat> to argue, argue, in short, in favour of censorship, against freedom of expression, and to do so, moreover, in an area of life that has traditionally been regarded as sacrosanct. I'm talking about the moral and religious education of children, and especially the edu education a child receives at home, where parents are allowed, even expected, to determine for their children what counts as truth and falsehood, right and wrong. Children, I'll, I'll argue, have a human right not to have their minds crippled by exposure to other people's bad ideas, no matter who those other people are. And parents, correspondingly, have no God-given license to enculturate their children in whatever ways they personally choose, no right to limit the horizons of their children's knowledge, to bring them up in an atmosphere of dogma and superstition, or to insist they follow the straight and narrow paths of their own faith. In short, children have a right not to have their minds addled by nonsense. And we, as a society, have a duty to protect them from it. So we should no more allow parents to teach their children to believe, for, for example, in the literal truth of the Bible, or that the planets rule their lives, than we should allow parents to knock their children's teeth out or to lock them in a dungeon. Now that's the negative side of what I want to say, but there will be a positive side as well. If children have a right to be protect protected from false ideas, they also have a right to be succored by the truth. And we, as a society, have a duty to prov provide it. Therefore, we should feel as much obliged to pass on to our children the best scientific and philosophical understanding of the natural world, to teach, for example, the truths of evolution and cosmology, or the methods of rational analysis. We should have as much an obligation to do that as we already feel obliged to feed and shelter, them, shelter children. Now, I don't suppose you'll doubt my good intentions here. Even so, I realize there must be some of you, especially the more liberal of you, that's probably all of you, um, who don't like the sound of this at all, neither the negative side of it nor, perhaps still less, the positive side of it. In which case, among the good questions you might have for me will probably be these. First, what is all this about truths and lies? How could anyone these days have the face to argue that modern the modern scientific view of the world is the only true view that there is? Haven't the postmodernists and relativists taught us that more, than, that more or less anything can be true in its own way? What possible justification could there be then for presuming to protect children from one set of ideas or to steer them towards another if, at the end of the day, all ideas are equally valid? And then second, even supposing that in some boring sense the scientific view really is more true than some others, who's to say that this truer worldview is actually a better one? At any rate, the better for everybody. 
Isn't it possible or actually likely that particular individuals, given who they are and what their life situation is, would be better served by one of the not-so-true worldviews? How could it possibly be right to insist on teaching children to think this modern way, when in practice the more traditional ways of thinking might actually work best for them? And then third, even in the unlikely event that almost everybody really would be happier and better off if they were brought up with the modern scientific picture, do we, as a global community, really want everyone right across the world thinking the same way, everyone living in a dreary scientific monoculture? Don't we want pluralism and cultural diversity, a hundred flowers blooming, a hundred schools of thought contending? And then last, why, when it comes to it, should children's rights be considered so much more important than those of other people? Everyone would grant, of course, that children are relatively innocent and relatively vulnerable, and so may have more need for protection than their seniors do. Still, why should their, the children's special rights in this respect take precedence over everybody else, else's rights in other respects? Don't parents have their own rights too? Their rights as parents, their right most obviously to be parents, or literally to bring forth and prepare their children for the future, as they think, as they see fit? Well, I said those are good questions, and some of you may think they're knock-down questions, questions to which any broad-minded and progressive person could only give one answer. Now, I agree they are goodish questions, and ones I should deal with, but I don't think it's by any means so obvious what the answers are, especially for a liberal. Indeed, were we to change the context not so greatly, most people's liberal instincts would, I'm sure, pull quite the other way. Let's suppose we are talking not about children's minds, but about children's bodies. Suppose the issue were not who should control, control a child's intellectual develop, development, but who should control the development of her hands, or feet, or genitalia. Let's suppose, indeed, that this is a lecture about female circumcision, and the issue is not whether anyone should be permitted to deny a girl knowledge, knowledge of Darwin, but whether anyone should be permitted to deny her the use of her clitoris. And now here I am suggesting that it's a girl's right to be left intact, that parents have no right to mutilate their daughters to suit their own socio-sexual agendas, and that we, as a society, ought to prevent it. What's more, what if I were to make the positive case as well, that every girl should actually be encouraged to find out how best to use, to her own advantage, the intact body she was born with? Well, would you still have those same good questions for me? And would it still be so obvious what the liberal answers are? There'll be a lesson, even if an awful one, in hearing how the questions sound. First, what is all this about intactness and mutilation? Haven't the anthropological rel relativists taught us that the idea of there being any such thing as absolute intactness is an, is an illusion, and that girls are, in a way, just as, just as intact without their clitorises? And anyway, even if uncircumcised girls are, in some boring sense, more intact, who's to say that intactness is a virtue? Isn't it possible that some girls, given their life situation, would actually be better off not being so intact? What if the men in their culture consider inta intact women unmarriageable? And besides, who wants to live in a world where all women have standard genitalia? Isn't it essential to maintaining the rich tapestry of human culture that there should be at least a few groups where circumcision is still practiced? Doesn't it indeed indirectly enrich the lives of all of us to know that some women somewhere have had their clitorises removed? In any case, why should it only be the rights of the girls that concern us? Don't other people have rights in relation to circumcision also? How about the rights of the circumcisers themselves, their rights as circumcisers? or the rights of mothers to do what they think best, just as, as in their own day was done to them. Well, you'll ag agree, I hope, that um, the answers pull the other way now. Uh, I'm not going to leave that particular distressing picture up for you much longer. Um, but maybe some of you are going to say that this is not playing fair. Whatever the superficial similarities between doing things to a child's body and doing things to her mind, there are also several obvious and important differences. For one thing, the effects of circumcision are final and irreversible, while the effects of even the most restrictive regime of education can perhaps be undone later. 
for another. Circumcision involves the removal of something that is already part of the body and will naturally be missed, while education involves selectively adding things, adding new things to the mind that, that would otherwise never have been there. To, to, be, to be deprived of the pleasures of bodily sensation is an insult at the most personal of levels, but to be deprived of a way of thinking is perhaps no great personal loss. And so you might argue that the analogy is too crude for us to learn from it. And those original questions about the rights to control a child's education still need addressing and answering on their own terms. And so very well, I will try and answer them on their own terms. And we'll see whether or not the analogy with circumcision is actually unfair. But there may be another kind of objection to my project that I should deal with first. For it might be argued, I suppose, that the whole issue of intellectual rights is not worth bothering about, since so few of the world's children are, in point of fact, at risk of being hurt by any severely misleading forms of education. And those that are are mostly far away and out of reach. But now that I say that, however, I, I wonder whether anyone could make such a claim with a straight face. Look around you, close to home. We ourselves live in a society where most adults and I don't just mean a few crazies, but most adults subscribe to a whole variety of weird and nonsensical beliefs that in one way or another they do shamelessly impose on their children. In the United States, for example, which I take to be the example... Uh, the United States, I take to the example, since it claims to be the most modern and libertarian society in the world, there it sometimes seems that almost everyone is either a religious fundamentalist or a New Age mystic or both. And even those who aren't uh, will scarcely dare admit it. Opinion polls confirm, for example, that a full 98% of the US population say they believe in God. 70% believe in life after death. 50% believe in human psychic powers. 30% think their lives are directly influenced by the position of the stars. And 70% follow their horoscopes anyway, just in case. And 20% believe that they are at risk of being abducted by aliens. And the problem, I mean, the problem for children's education is not just that so many adults po positively believe in things that flat flatly contradict the scientific worldview. Um, it's that so many, so many do not believe in things that are absolutely central to the scientific view. A survey published a year or two ago showed that half the American people do not know, for example, that the Earth goes round the Sun once a year. Fewer than one in ten knows what a molecule is. More than half do not accept that human beings have evolved from animal ancestors, and less than one in ten believe that evolution, if it's occurred, can have taken place without some kind of ex external intervention. And not only do people not know the results of science, they don't know what science is. When asked what they think distinguishes the scientific outlook, only 2% realised, 2% of the population realised it involves putting theories to the test. 34% vaguely knew it has something to do with experiments and measurement, but 66% didn't have a clue what science is about. Nor do those figures, worrying as they are, give the full picture of what children are up against. They tell us about the beliefs of typical people, and so about the belief in the environment of the average child. But there are small but significant communities just down the road from us, and I mean literally just down the road in New York or London, or I'm sure in Lund as well, where the situation is arguably very much worse. Communities where not only are superstition and ignorance even firm, firmly, more firmly entrenched, but where this goes hand in hand with the imposition of repressive regimes of social and interpersonal conduct. Um, of, in relation to hygiene, or diet, or dress, or sex, or gender roles, marriage arrangements, and so on. I think, for example, of the Amish Christians, or the Hasidic Jews, or the Jehovah's Witnesses, Witnesses, Orthodox Muslims, or, for that matter, of the radical New Agers. All, no doubt, very different from each other, but all with their own peculiar hang-ups and neuroses, all alike in providing an intellectual and cultural dungeon for those who live among them. Now, in theory, of course, maybe the children need not suffer. Adults might perhaps keep their beliefs to themselves and not make any active attempt to pass them on. 
but we know, I'm sure, better than to expect that. This kind of self-restraint is simply not in the nature of a parent-child relationship. If a mother, for example, sincerely believes that homosexuality is an offence to God, then she will, of course, enlist her own children in the crusade. Um, and look at who's the ages of the kids carrying the placards in an American street. But equally, equally with more benign stupidities, if she believes that eating pork is a sin, or that the best cure for depression is holding a crystal to her head, or that after she dies she will be reincarnated as a mongoose, uh, or that Capricorns and Aries are bound to qu quarrel, no doubt she'll want to pass on these very important lessons to her own offspring. And furthermore, restraint is not in the nature of successful belief systems. Belief systems in general flourish or die out according to how good they are at reproduction and competition. The better a system is at creating copies of itself, and the better at keeping other rival belief systems at bay, the greater its own chances of evolving and holding its own. So we should expect uh, that it will be characteristic of successful belief systems, especially those that survive when everything else seems to be against them, that their, devot their devotees will be obsessed with education and discipline, insisting on the rightness of their own ways and rubbishing or preventing access to other ways. We should expect, moreover, that they will make a special point of targeting children in the home, while they're still available, impressionable, and vulnerable. For as the Jesuit master wisely noted, if I have the teaching of, of children up to seven years of age or thereabouts, I care not who has them afterwards. They are mine for life. The anthropologist Donald Crabill, who made a close study of an Amish community in Pennsylvania, was well placed to observe just how this works out in practice. Groups threatened by extinction, he writes, must indoctrinate their offspring if they want to preserve their unique heritage. Social socialization of the very young is one of the most potent, potent forms of social control. As cultural values slip into the child's mind, they become personal values, embedded in conscience and governed by emotions. The Amish contend that the Bible commissions parents to train their children in religious matters as well as the Amish way of life. An ethnic nursery, staffed by extended family and church members, moulds the Amish worldview in the child's mind from the first moments of consciousness. But what he's describing is not, of course, peculiar to the Amish. An ethnic nursery, staffed by extended family and church members, could be as much a description of the early environment of a Belfast Catholic, or a Birmingham Sikh, or of a Brooklyn Hasidic Jew, or maybe, for that matter, in its own way, the child of a Cambridge lecturer. All sects that are serious about their own survival do indeed make every attempt to flood the child's mind with their own propaganda and to deny the child access to any alternative viewpoints. In the United States, this kind of restricted education has continually received the blessing of the law. Parents have the legal right, if they wish, to educate their children um, entirely at home, and nearly one million families still do so. In fact, it's increasing, uh, and particularly in order that they shall uh, not be exposed to non-religious uh, ideas. Many more who wish to limit their children can rely on the thousands of sectarian schools that are permitted to function, subject to only minimal state supervision. The United States court did recently insist that teachers at a Baptist school should at least hold teaching certificates. But at the same time, it recognized that, I'm quoting, the whole purpose of such a school is to foster the, the development of their children's minds in a religious environment, and therefore that the school should be allowed to teach all its subjects in its own way, quotes, which meant, as it happened, presenting all subjects only from the biblical point of view and requiring all teachers, supervisors, and assistants to agree with the church's doctrinal position. Yet parents hardly need the support of the law to achieve such a baleful hegemony over their children's minds. For there are, unfortunately, many ways of isolating children from external influences without actually physically removing or controlling what they hear in class. Dress a little boy in the uniform of the Hasidim, curl his side locks, subject him to strange dietary taboos, make him spend all weekend reading the Torah, tell him that Gentiles are dirty, and you could send him to any school in the world, and he'd still be a child of the Hasidim. 
And the same, just term, change the terms a bit, for a child of the Muslims or the Roman Catholics or the followers of the Maharishi Yogi. More worrying still, the children themselves may often be unwitting, unwitting collaborators in this game of isolation. For children all too, e so all too easily learn who they are, what is allowed for them, and where they must not go, even in thought. John Shoemaker, an Australian psychologist, has described his own Catholic boyhood. I believed wholeheartedly that I would burn in a tunnel fire if I, met, if I ate meat on a Friday. I now hear that people no longer spend an eternity in fire for eating meat on Fridays. Um, yet I cannot help thinking back on the many Saturdays when I rushed to confess about the bologna and ketchup sandwich I could not resist the day before. I usually hoped I would not die before getting to the 3 p.m. confession. But all the same, this particular Catholic boy, John Shoemaker, he actually escaped and lived to tell the, tell the tale. And in fact, he's gone on to become an atheist and to make something of a profession of his godlessness. And nor, of course, is he unique. There are plenty of other, of other examples we all know of, um, to, of men and women who, as children, were pressured into becoming junior members of a sect, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Marxist, and yet who came out the other side, free thinkers and seemingly none the worse for their experience. Then perhaps I am, after all, being too alarmist about what all this means. For sure, the risks are real enough. We do live, even in our advanced democratic Western nations, in an environment of spiritual oppression, where many little children, our neighbors' children, if not actually ours, are daily exposed to the attempts of adults to annex their minds. Yet you may still want to point out that there's a big difference between what the adults want and what, they act what actually goes on. All right, so children do frequently get saddled with adult nonsense, but so what? Maybe it's just something the child has to put up with until he or she is able to leave home and to learn better. In which case, I'd have to admit that the issue is certainly nothing like so serious as I've been making out. After all, there are surely lots of things that are done to children, either accidentally or by design, that though they may not be ideal for the child at the time, have no, last, no lasting ill effects. Well, I'd reply yes and no. Yes, it's right we should not fall into the error of a previous generation of psychology, of assuming that people's values and beliefs are determined once and for all by what they learn or do not learn as children. In fact, the first years of life, though certainly formative, are not necessarily the critical period they were once thought to be. Psychologists no longer generally believe that children imprint on the first ideas they come across and thereafter refuse to follow any others. In most cases, rather, it seems that individuals can and will remain open to new opportunities of learning later in life, and if need be, will be able to make up, an, make up a surprising amount of lost ground in areas where they've earlier been deprived or been misled. So yes, I agree, therefore, we shouldn't be too alarmist or too prissy about the effects of early learning. But then, no, we should certainly not be too sanguine about it either. True, it may not be so difficult for a person to unlearn or replace factual knowledge later in life. Someone who once thought the world was flat, for example, may, when faced by overwhelming evidence to the contrary, grudgingly come round to accept that the world is actually round. It will, however, often be very much more difficult for a person to unlearn established procedures or habits of thought. Someone who's grown used, for example, to taking everything on trust from biblical authority may find it very hard indeed to adopt a more critical and questioning attitude. And it may be now impossible for a person to unlearn attitudes and emotional reactions. Someone who's learned as a child, for example, to think of sex as sinful may never again be able to be relaxed about making love. And Paul Ekman in his lecture a couple of days ago was also making just that point about some of these things really do stick, especially the emotional ones. But there's another reason more, uh, more pressing than this for not being too sanguine or sanguine in the least. Research has shown that given the opportunity, individuals can go on learning and re recover from poor, poor childhood environments. However, what we should be worrying about are precisely those cases where such opportunities do not, indeed are not allowed to occur. Suppose, as I began to describe above, children are in effect locked out by their families from access to any alternative ideas. 
or worse, that they're so effectively immunized against foreign influences that they do the locking out themselves. Think of those cases, not so uncommon, where it's become a central plank of someone's belief system, that they must not let themselves be defiled by mixing with others, when, because of their faith, all they want to hear is one voice, and all they want to read is one text, when they treat new ideas as if they carry infection, when, later, as they grow more sophisticated, they come to deride reason as an instrument of Satan, when they regard the humility of unquestioning obedience as a virtue, when they identify ignorance of worldly affairs with spiritual grace. In such cases, it hardly matters that their minds may still remain capable of learning, because they themselves will, will have made certain that they never again use this capacity. The question was, does childhood indoctrination matter? And the answer, I regret to say, is yes, it matters even more than you might guess. The Jesuit did know what he was saying. Though human beings are remarkably resilient, the truth is that the effects of well-designed indoctrination may still prove irreversible, because one of the effects of such indoctrination will be precisely to remove the means and the motivation to reverse it. Several of these belief systems couldn't survive in a free and open market of comparison and criticism, but they've cunningly seen to it that they don't have to, by enlisting believers as their own jailers. There was a program two weeks ago on, on BBC television. Here's a quotation from one of the Hasidic Jews talking proudly about his, about his community in North London. The Hasidim see modern technology as a potential danger, putting at risk the holiness of the community and threatening the innocent minds of its children. Television is known as the Yetzahara box, which roughly translated means the evil temptation machine. Owning one can be likened to having an open sewer in the lounge. Now that's in 2011 in North London. Still, we can ask, what would happen if this kind of vicious circle of self-imprisonment were, in fact, to be forcibly broken? What would happen if, for example, there were to be an externally imposed time out? Wouldn't we predict that just to the extent that it is a vicious circle, the process of becoming a fully-fledged believer might, in fact, be surprisingly easy to disrupt? I think the clearest evidence of how these belief systems typically hold o sway over their followers can in fact be found in historical examples of what's happened when group members have been involuntarily exposed to the fresh air of the outside world. An interesting, an interesting example, an interesting test of this was provided in the 1960s by the case of the Amish and the military draft. The Amish have tradition have consistently refused to serve in the armed forces of the United States on grounds of conscience. Up to the 1960s, young Amish men who were due to be drafted for military service were regularly granted agricultural deferments and were able to continue working safely on their family farms. But as the draft con continued throughout the Vietnam War, an increasing number of these men were deemed ineligible for farm deferments and were required instead to serve two years working in public hospitals, where they were introduced, like it or not, to all manner of non-Amish people and non-Amish ways. Now, when the time came for these men to return home, many of them no longer wanted to do so and opted to defect. They'd tasted the sweets of a more open, adventurous, free-thinking way of life and they were not about to declare it all a snare and a delusion. Now, these defections were rightly regarded by the Amish leaders as such a serious threat to their culture's survival that they quickly moved to negotiate a special agreement with the government under which all their draftees could in future be sent to Amish-run farms so that, so that this kind of breach of security should not happen again. So let me take stock. I've been discussing the survival strategies of some of the more tenacious belief systems, the epidemiology, if you like, of those religious and pseudo-religious ideas that Richard Dawkins has called cultural viruses. Richard Dawkins has called cultural viruses. But you'll see that, especially with this last example, I've begun to approach the next and more important of the issues I want to address today, the ethical one. Suppose that, as the Amish case suggests, young members of such a faith would, if given the opportunity to make up their own minds, choose to leave. 
Doesn't this say something important about the morality of imposing any such faith on children to begin with? Well, I think it does, and in fact, I think it says everything we need, need to know in order to condemn it. Suppose, again, it were female circumcision we were talking about. We could surely build a moral case against it based just on considering whether it was something a woman would choose for herself. Given the fact, and I assume it is a fact, that most of those, those, women, who was, most of those women who are circumcised as children would, if they only knew what they were missing, have preferred to remain intact. Given that almost no woman who is not, not circumcised as a child volunteers to undergo the operation later in life. Given, in short, that it seems not to be what free women want to have done to their bodies, then it seems clear that whoever takes advantage of their temporary power over a child's body to perform the operation must be abusing their power and acting wrongly. Well, then, if that's so for bodies, then I think the same for minds. Given, let's say, that most people who've been brought up as, a member, as members of a sect would, if they only knew what they, were, what they were being denied, have preferred to remain outside it, given that almost no one who was brought up this way volunteers to adopt the faith later in life, given, in short, that it's not a faith that a free thinker would adopt, then, likewise, it seems clear that whoever takes advantage of their temporary power over a child's mind to impose this faith is equally abusing this power and acting wrongly. So I'll come to the main point and lesson of, of my lecture. I want to propose a general test for deciding when and whether the teaching of a belief system is morally defensible. And it's as follows. If it's ever the case that teaching the system, a belief system to children is, sorry, if it's ever the case that teaching this system to children will mean that later in life they come to hold beliefs that were they in fact to have had access to alternatives they would most likely not have chosen for themselves, then it's morally wrong of, wh of whoever presumes to impose this system and to choose for them to do so. No one has the right to choose badly for anyone else. Now, this test, I admit, will not be simple to apply. It's rare enough for, the, the, for there to be the kind of social experiment that occurred with the Amish and the military draft. And even such an experiment doesn't actually provide so strong, as a, strong a test as I'm suggesting we require. After all, the Amish young men were not offered the alternative until they were already almost grown up. Whereas what we need to know is what the children of the Amish or any other sect would choose for themselves if they were to have had access to the full range of alternatives all along. But in practice, of course, such a total, totally free choice is never going to be available. But still, utopian as the criterion is, I think its moral implications remain pretty obvious. For even supposing we cannot know and can only guess on the basis of weaker tests whether an individual exercising this genuinely free choice would himself choose the beliefs that others intend to oppose, impose upon him, then this state of ignorance is in itself grounds for making it morally wrong for anyone else to proceed to impose beliefs on him. Now, I suspect most of you will probably be happy to go along with this, so far as it goes. Of course, other things being equal, everybody has a right to self-determination of both body and mind, and it must indeed be morally wrong of others to stand in the way of it. But that is other things being equal. And to continue with those questions I raised earlier, what happens when other things are not equal? It's surely a commonplace in ethics that sometimes the rights of individuals have to be limited or even overruled in the interests of the larger good or to protect the rights of other people. And it's certainly not immediately obvious why the case of children's intellectual rights should be an exception. As we saw, there are several factors that might be considered counterbalancing. And of these, the one that seems to most people, or to many people, the weightiest one, or at least is often mentioned first, is our interest in maintaining uh, cultural diversity. Uh, all right, you may want to say, so it's tough on a child of the Amish or the Hasidim or the, or the gypsies to be shaped up by their parents in the way that they have been. But at least the result is that these fascinating cultural traditions continue. Wouldn't our whole civilization be impoverished if they were to go? 
It's a shame, maybe, when individuals have to be sacrificed to maintain such diversity. But there it is. It's the price we pay as a society. Except, I feel, I feel bound to remind you, it's not the price we pay. It's the price they pay. <coughs> Let me give a telling example. Um, in 1995, in the high mountains of Peru, some climbers came across the frozen, mummified body of a young Inca girl. She was dressed as a princess. She was 13 years old. About 500 years ago, this little girl had, it seems, been taken alive up the mountain by a party of priests and then ritually killed, a sacrifice to the mountain's gods in the hope that they would look kindly on the people below. The discovery was described by the anthropologist, John Johann Reinhardt, in an article for the National Geographic magazine. And he was clearly elated, both as a scientist as an, and as a human being, by the romance of finding what he called this ice maiden. Even so, he did express some reservations about how she'd come to be there. We can't help but shudder, he wrote, at the Inca's practice of performing human sacrifice. Well, this discovery was also made the subject of a documentary film shown on American television. Uh, some of you may even have seen the National Geographic film. But in the film, however, no one expressed any reservations, uh, whatever. Instead, viewers were simply invited to marvel at the spiritual commitment of the Inca priests and to share with the girl on her last journey um, the, her pride and excitement at having been selected for the signal honour of being sacrificed. The message of the TV programme was, in effect, that the practice of human sacrifice was, in its own way, a glorious cultural invention, another jewel in the crown of multiculturalism, if you like. But how dare anyone suggest this? How dare they invite us in our sitting rooms, watching television, to feel uplifted by contemplating an act of ritual murder. The murder of a dependent child by a group of stupid, puffed up, superstitious, ignorant old men. How dare they invite us to find good for ourselves in contemplating an immoral act against someone else? Well, immoral? Immoral, do I mean by Inca standards? No, not, that's not what matters. I mean but immoral by our standards, and in particular by the standard of free choice that I was enunciating earlier. The plain fact is that none of us, knowing what we do now about how the world works, would freely choose to be sacrificed uh, as she was. And however proud the Inca girl may or may not have been to, uh, to have had the choice made for her by her family, and for all we know, she may actually have felt betrayed and terrified we can still be pretty sure that she, if she'd known what we do know now, would not have chosen this fate for herself. No, this girl was being used by others as a means for achieving their ends. The elders of her community valued their collective security above her life and decided for her that she must die in order that their crops might grow and that they might live. Now, 500 years later, we ourselves must not in a lesser way do the same by thinking of her death as something that enriches our collective culture. We mustn't do that here, and nor in any of the other cases where, invite, where we're invited to celebrate other people's subjection to quaint and backward traditions as evidence of what a rich world we live in. We mustn't do it even when it can be argued, as I would agree it sometimes can be, that the maintenance of these minority traditions is potentially a benefit to all of us because they keep alive ways of thinking that might one day serve as a valuable counterpoint to the majority culture. The United States Supreme Court, in supporting the Amish claim to be exempt from sending their children to public schools, commented in an aside, we must not forget that in the Middle Ages, um, important values of the civilization of the members, sorry, Important values of the civilization of the Western world were preserved by members of religious orders who isolated themselves from all worldly influences against great obstacles. And by analogy, the court implied, we should recognize that the Amish may be preserving ideas and values that our own descendants may one way, one day, wish to return to. But what the courts fail to recognize is, is that there's a crucial difference between the religious communities of the Middle Ages, the monks of Holy Island, for example, um, and the present-day Amish, namely that the monks made their own choice to become monks. 
They didn't have monasticism imposed on them as children, nor did they in turn impose it on their children, for indeed they didn't have any. These medieval orders survived by the recruitment of adult volunteers. The Amish, by contrast, survive only by kidnapping little children before they can protest. The Amish may possibly have wonderful things to teach the rest of the world, and so may possibly the Incas of Don, and so may several other outlying groups. But these things must not be paid for by the children's lives. That's surely the crux of it. It's a cornerstone of every decent moral system, stated explicitly by Immanuel Kant, but already implicit in most people's very idea of morality, that human individuals have an absolute right to be treated as ends in themselves, and never as means to achieving other people's ends. It goes without saying that this right applies no less to children than to anybody else. And since, in so many situations, children are in no position to look after themselves, it's morally obvious that the rest of us have a particular duty to watch out for them. And so, in every case where we come across individuals, examples of children's lives being manipulated to serve other ends, I think we do have a duty to protest. And this no matter whether the other ends involve the mollification of the gods, or the preservation of important values for Western civilization, or the creation of an interesting anthropological exhibit for the rest of us, or, and, and I'll come to the next big question that's been waiting, even if uh, it's being done in order to fulfill certain needs and aspirations of the child's own parents. There is, I'd say, no reason whatever why we should treat the actions of parents as coming under a different set of moral rules here. The relationship of parent to child is, of course, a special one in all sorts of ways. But it's not so special as to deny the child her individual personhood. It's not a relationship of extension, nor one of ownership. Children are not a part of their parents, nor except figuratively do they belong to them. Children are in no sense their parents' private property. And indeed, to quote the US Supreme Court commenting in a different context on this same issue, it's, quote, a moral fact that a person belongs to himself and not others, nor to society as a whole. So it will therefore be as much a breach of a child's right if he or she is used by their parents to achieve the parents' personal goals as it would be if this were being done by anyone else. No one has a right to treat children as anything less than ends in themselves. But still, I'm, some of you, I'm sure, will want to argue that the case of parents is not quite the same as that of outsiders. <coughs> And no doubt we'd all agree that parents have, um, no, sorry, no doubt we would all agree that parents have no more right than anyone else to exploit children for ends that are obviously selfish, to abuse them sexually, for example, or to exploit them as servants, or to sell them into slavery. But first, isn't it different when the parents at least think their own ends are the child's ends too? When their manipulation of the child's beliefs to conform to theirs is, so far as they are concerned, entirely in the child's best interests? And then second, isn't it different when the parents have already invested so much of their own resources in the child, giving him or her so much of their love and care and time? Haven't they somehow earned the reward of having their child honour their beliefs, even if these beliefs are, by other people's lights, eccentric or old-fashioned? Don't these considerations together mean that parents do at least have some rights that other people don't? and rights which arguably should come before or at least rank beside the rights of the children themselves. Well, I'd say no. The truth is these considerations simply don't add up to any form of rights, let alone rights that could outweigh the children's rights. At, at most, they simply provide mitigating circumstances. Imagine, suppose you were misguidedly to give your own child poison. The fact that you might think the poison you were administering was good for your child the fact that you might have gone to a lot of trouble to obtain this poison, and that if it were not, uh, that if it were not for all your efforts, your child wouldn't even be there to be offered it. None of this would give you a right to administer the poison. At most, it would only make you less culpable when the child died. But in any case, to see parents as simply misguided about the child's in true interests is, I think, to put too generous a construction on it. For it's not at all clear that parents when they 
take control of their children's spiritual and intellectual lives really do believe that they're acting in the child's best interests rather than their own. Abraham, when he was commanded by God on the mountain to kill his son Isaac and dutifully went ahead with the preparation, was surely not thinking of what was best for Isaac. He was thinking of his own relationship with God, and so on down the ages. Parents have used and still use their children to bring themselves spiritual or social benefits, dressing them up, educating them, baptizing them, bringing them to confirmation or bar mitzvah in order to maintain their own social and religious standing. Consider again the analogy with circumcision. No one should make the mistake of supposing that female circumcision in those places where it's practiced is done to benefit the girl. Rather, it's done for the honor of the family, to demonstrate the parents' commitment to a tradition, to save them from dishonor. Um, and it's much the same, I'd say, in many of the other cases I've been discussing. A Christian fundamentalist mother, for example, forbids her child from attending classes on evolution. Well, though she may claim she's doing it for the child, and not, of course, herself, she's very likely motivated primarily by a desire to make a display of her own purity. Doesn't she just know that God is mighty proud of her for conforming to his will? The chief mullah of Saudi Arabia proclaims that the earth is flat and that anyone who teaches otherwise is a friend of Satan. Or won't the mullah be uh, himself thrice blessed by Allah for making this courageous stand? A group of rabbis in Jerusalem try to ban the showing of the film Jurassic Park on the grounds that it may give children the idea that there were dinosaurs living on Earth 60 million years ago, when the scriptures, of course, state that, in fact, the world is just 6,000 6, years old. Well, aren't those rabbis making a wonderful public demonstration of their piety? What we're seeing, as often as not, is pure self-interest, in which case we shouldn't even allow a mitigating plea of good intentions on the part of the parent or the other responsible adult. They're looking after no one other than themselves. Yet, as I said, in the end, it hardly matters what the parent's intentions are, because even, with the, even the best intentions would not be sufficient to buy them parental rights over their children. Indeed, the very idea uh, that parents or any, any other adults have rights over children is morally insupportable. No human being in any other circumstances is credited with having rights over anyone else. No one is entitled, as of right, to control, use, or direct the life course of another person, even for objectively good ends. It's true that in the past, slave owners had such legal rights over their slaves. And it's true that until comparatively recently, the anomaly persisted of husbands having certain such rights over their wives, the right to have sex with them, for example. But neither of these exceptions, I think, provides a good model for regulating parent-child relationships. Children, to repeat, have to be considered as having interests independent of their parents. They cannot be subsumed as if they were part of the same person. At least, so it should be. And thus, that is, we take the extraordinary, make the extraordinary mistake that the US Supreme Court apparently did when it ruled in relation to the Amish, that while the Amish way of life may be considered good or even erratic, it interferes with no rights or interests of others. As if the children of the Amish are not even to be counted as potentially others. I think we should stop talking of parental rights at all. Insofar as they compromise the child's rights as an individual, parents' rights have no status in ethics and should have none in law. That's not to say that other things being equal, parents shouldn't be uh, treated by the rest of us with due respect and accorded certain privileges in relation to their children. Privileges, however, do not have the same legal or moral status uh, significance as rights. Privileges are by no means unconditional. They come as the quid pro quo for agreeing to abide by certain rules of conduct imposed by society as a large, at large. And anyone to whom a privilege is granted remains in effect on probation. A privilege granted can be taken away. Let's suppose that the privilege of parenting will mean, for example, that provided parents agree to act within an agreed framework, um, they shall indeed be allowed, without interference from the law, to do all the things that parents everywhere usually do do. Feeding, clothing, educated, educating, disciplining their children, and enjoying the love and creative involvement that follow from it. 
but it will explicitly not be part of this deal that parents should be allowed to offend against the children's more fundamental rights to self-determination. If parents abuse their privileges in this regard, the contract lapses, and it's then the duty of those who have granted the privilege to intervene. Well, intervene, how? Suppose we, I mean we as a society, don't like what's happening when the education of a child has been left to the parents or the priests. Suppose we fear for the child's mind and want to take remedial action. Suppose, indeed, we want to take preemptive action with all children to protect, protect them from being hurt by bad ideas and to give them the best possible start as thoughtful human beings. Well, what should, what should we, we, be, we be doing about it? What should be our birthday present to them from the grown-up world? My suggestion at the start of this talk was science, universal scientific education. That's to say, education in learning from observation, experiment, hypothesis testing, constructive doubt, critical thinking, and in the truths that flow from that. And so I've come at last to what's the most provocative of the questions that I asked, asked at the start. What's so special about science? Why these truths? Why should it be morally right to teach this to everybody when it's apparently more so morally wrong to teach all those other things? Well, you don't have to be one of those out-and-out -out relativists to ask such questions and to be suspicious that, that any attempt to replace the old truths by new, newer scientific truths might be nothing more than an attempt to replace one dogm dogmatism by another. The Supreme Court, in its judgment about Amish schooling, was careful to warn that we should never rule out one way of thinking and rule another in, merely on the basis of what happens to be the modern fashionable opinion. There can be no assumption, the court said, that today's majority is right and the Amish and others are wrong. The Amish way of life is not to be condemned because it's different. Well, maybe so, and yet I'd say the court has chosen to focus on the wrong issue here. Even if science were the majority worldview, which, as we saw er earlier, is hardly the case, we'd all agree that this in itself would uh, pro provide no grounds for promoting science over other systems of thought. The majority is clearly not right about lots of things, and probably about most things. But the grounds I'm proposing are much firmer. I think science stands apart and superior to all, all the other systems because it alone, of all the systems in contention, meets the criterion I laid out above, namely that it represents a set of beliefs that any reasonable person would, if given the chance, choose for himself. Now, I should say that again, I think, and put it in context. I argued earlier that the only circumstances under which it should be morally acceptable to impose a particular way of thinking on children is when the result will be that later in life they come to hold beliefs that they would have chosen anyway, no matter what alternative beliefs they were exposed to. And what I'm now saying is that science is the one way of thinking, maybe the only one, that passes this test. There's a fundamental asymmetry between science and everything else. What do you reckon? Let's go to the rescue of that Inca girl who's being told by the priests that unless she dies on the mountain, the gods will rain down lava on her, on her village. <clears throat> and let's offer her another way of looking at things. Offer her a choice as to how she'll grow up. On one side, with the story about divine anger. On the other, with the insights from geology as to how volcanoes arise from the movement of tectonic plates. Well, which story will she choose? Let's go help the Muslim boy who's being schooled by the mullahs into believing that the earth is flat. And let's explore some of the ideas of scientific geography with him. Better still, let's take him high up in a balloon, show him the horizon, and invite him to use his own senses and powers of reasoning to reach his own conclusions. Now offer him a choice, the picture presented in the book of the Quran, or the one that flows from his newfound scientific understanding. Which will he prefer? Well, let's take picture on that Baptist teacher who's become wedded to creationism. And let's give her a vacation. Let's walk around the Natural History Museum in the company of Richard Dawkins or Daniel Dennett, or perhaps if they're too scary, David Attenborough. And let's have them explain the possibilities of evolution to her. Now offer her the choice. 
the story of Genesis with all its paradoxes and special pleading, or the startlingly simple idea of natural selection. Which will she choose? My, answers, my questions are rhetorical because the answers are already in. We know very well which way people will go when they really are allowed to make up their own minds on questions such as these. Conversions from superstition to science have been and are everyday events. They've probably been part of all of our personal experience. Those of us who've been walking in darkness have seen a great light, the aha of scientific revelation. By contrast, conversions from science back to super superstition are virtually unknown. It just doesn't happen that someone who's learnt and understood science and its methods and who's then offered a non-scientific alternative chooses to abandon science. I doubt there's ever been a case, for example, of someone who's been brought up to believe in the geological theory of volcanoes moving over to believing in divine anger instead. Or of someone who's seen and appreciated that the evidence that the evidence that the world is round reverting to the idea that the world is flat. Or even of someone who has once understood the power of Darwinian theory going back to preferring the story of Genesis. People do, of course, sometimes abandon their existing scientific beliefs in favour of new and better scientific alternatives. But to choose one scientific theory over another is still to remain absolutely true to science. The reason for this asymmetry between science and non-science isn't, at least it's not only, that science provides so much better, so much more economical, elegant, beautiful explanations than non-science, although there is that. The still stronger reason I'd suggest is that science is by its very nature a participatory process, and non-science is not. In learning science, we learn why we should believe this or that. Science doesn't cajole, it doesn't dictate, it lays out the factual and theoretical arguments as to why something is so and invites us to assent to them, to see it for ourselves. Hence, by the time someone has understood a scientific explanation, they have, in a sense, an important sense, already chosen it as theirs. How different is the case of religious or superstitious explanation? Religions make no pretense of engaging their devotees in any process of rational discovery or choice. If we dare ask why we should believe something, the answer will be because it's been written in the book, because this is our tradition, because it was good enough for Moses, because you'll go to heaven that way, or as often as not, just don't ask. Contrast these two positions. On the one side, the second century Roman theologian Tertullian, with his abject submission to authority and denial of our personal involvement in choosing our beliefs. For us, he wrote, Curiosity is no longer necessary after Jesus Christ, nor inquiry after the gospel. This being the same man, I might remind you, who said of Christianity, it's certain because it is impossible. On the other side, contrast the 12th century English philosopher Adelaide of Bath, one of the earliest interpreters of Arab science, with his injunction that we all make ourselves personally responsible for understanding what goes on around us. If anyone living in a house, he writes, is ignorant of what it's made, he's unworthy of its shelter. And if anyone born in the residence of this world neglects learning the plan underlying its marvellous beauty, he's unworthy and deserves to be cast out of it. So imagine that the choice is, 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 is yours. Think uh, that, that you've been faced in the formative years of your life with a choice between these two paths to enlightenment, between basing your beliefs on the ideas of others imported from another country and another time, and basing them on ideas that you have been able to see growing in your home soil. Can there be any doubt that you'll choose, which you'll choose for yourself, that you will choose science? And because people will so choose, if they have the opportunities of scientific education, I say that as a society, were entitled with good conscience to insist on their being given that opportunity. That is, we are entitled, entitled to choose this way of thinking for them. Indeed, we're not just entitled. In the case of children, we are morally obliged to do so, so as to protect them from being early victims of other ways of thinking that would remove them from the field. And so let me catch the question which 
I might get, probably not in this audience, but in other places I've talked this way. How would you like it if some big brother were to insist on your children being taught his beliefs? How would you like it if, it if I tried to impose my personal ideology on your little girl? Well, I do have the answer that teaching science isn't like that. It's not about teaching someone else's beliefs. It's about encouraging the child to exercise her own powers of understanding, to arrive at her own beliefs. For sure, this is likely to mean that my daughter will end up with beliefs that are widely shared with others who've taken the same path. Beliefs, that is, in what science reveals as the truth about the world. And yes, if you want to put it this way, you could say this means that by her own efforts at understanding, she will become a scientific conformist, one of those predictable people who believes that matter is made of atoms, that the universe arose with the Big Bang, that humans are descended from monkeys, that consciousness is a function of the brain, that there's no life after death, and so on. But uh, since someone asks, I'll say I'd be only too pleased if a big brother or a big sister or a school teacher or anyone else in this room should help her get to that enlightened state. The habit of questioning, the ability to tell good answers from bad, an appetite for seeing how and why deep explanations work. Such is what I would want for my daughter because I think it's what she, given the chance, would one day want for herself. But it's also, it's also what I'd want for her because I'm too well aware of what might otherwise befall her. Bad ideas continue to swill through our culture, some old, some new, looking for receptive minds to capture. If this girl, because she was to lack, to lack the defences of critical reasoning, were ever to fall to some kind of political or spiritual irrationalism, then I and you and our society would have failed her. Words, children are made of the words they hear. It matters what we tell them. They can be hurt by words. They may go on to hurt themselves still further and in turn become the kind of people that hurt others. But they can be given life by words as well. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. These are the words of Deuteronomy. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. And I think there should be no limit to our duty to help children to choose life. Uh, the title of, of uh, this lecture was What Shall We Tell the Children? And I think there is an ambiguity in this very question uh, pertaining to the word we. And most of your talk, you were, were interested in the question who should tell the children, rather. And, and your answer to that is that it should not be the parents. It should be someone else, the society or something like that. Well, uh, 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 the we... Let, let, let me finish, sorry, please. Go on, uh, continue. And there are, of course, lots of examples of parents with very strange beliefs that are obviously wrong or, or in, in some sense. But there are also lots of cases of governments that have been based on totally false systems of belief. So w what makes you think that governments and society at large is a better recipient of your advice well, than I parents are? I, I said that governments shouldn't teach anything to children. What they should teach is critical thinking, scientific uh, ideas, introduce them to uh, the world which is derived from exploration and from discovery, um, and teach them to, to always think twice about uh, uh, ideas f for which there's no basis in, in rationality or in, or, in, or in observations in the world. In other words, I said there's one particular kind of education which I think we can defend it against you know, wh whoever it's coming from. And Parents should teach that, and governments should teach that. Um, and insofar as that means that we must uh, teach it in opposition to what the particular 
cultural group or this particular family would wish to have taught to their children, um, then I think we should intervene and insist uh, that the parents have no right to restrict the child's education. In a lot of British faith schools, for example, in, and even more in American faith schools, it's still allowed and expected that I mean, the teachers will actually uh, teach biblical nonsense against uh, uh, scientific ideas. Darwinism does not have to be taught, for example, in Muslim schools, faith schools, or in Jewish faith schools in Britain. Um, they are, the teachers are allowed to, to, to have it entirely their own way. Um, and these kids end up, of course, following that in the, in the tradition, and in fact, not wanting to learn the alternatives. Those children, what I've said is that if they'd been given the chance of a more open education, would almost certainly not have gone the way they end up uh, going. Um, so it's uh, the we of the title, is, uh, I, I, it's a rhetorical question, because we all ask about our own children, about other people's children, and what we as a society should do. What should we be telling the children? Um, and what I'm saying is that, that, that there are some things we absolutely should not be telling them, and there are some things we almost certainly should, as a matter of duty, be telling them. Um, it's not all religious ideas. I mean, not all religious ideas are dangerous. Of course they're not. Some of them are very comforting and so on. But it's the, it's the kind of educational system which, as I described, persuades the child to become her own jailer, to stop asking questions, to not want to mix or to uh, learn other ideas. Um, in other words, the, the very kind of, uh, of, of education which so successfully uh, allows these cults to survive, um, which we should, we should intervene to stop it. But, uh, sorry. Um, as an American, I was a bit skeptical of some of the figures you were quoting. So there are figures I have seen that would suggest there are a lot more atheists in America than just 2%, which, uh, if I was hearing your figures correctly. Uh, regardless, um, there are figures that uh, are not, as far as I know, in any dispute, um, which include that over half of Americans do not attend any regular religious services. Over half of Americans do not have any formal religious structure of beliefs. And even among religious Americans, there's, of course, quite a wide uh, diversity of belief systems, so many, if not Perhaps most of them would not contest any of the principles of science unless you take it to be among the principles of science that science has proven that religion is wrong or that there definitely is no afterlife or something like this. Um, I have some familiarity with the Amish community. I grew up in Pennsylvania. And there is a, a practice of some long standing among the Amish community, which you may or may not be familiar with where the Amish youth of a certain age are encouraged to go out into the world, not in their parents' or religious leaders' supervision, drink, have sex, do drugs, break all of the rules, and then, surprisingly, perhaps to you and to me, most of them do come back. So I think the interpretation of the, uh, the story about the draft is subject to being told in, in, in a number of different ways. Um, I have a bit more familiarity with the old order Mennonites because my mother and sister live in a community where there are a lot of Mennonites. They're very closely related to the Amish. The Amish broke off from the Mennonites. Um, and while there are some things about that community that I very strongly disagree with uh, in terms of the way they raise their children in terms of their theology. There are other things that I deeply appreciate. Um, so there was a phrase used about living in a dungeon. I don't think the old order Mennonite in my mother and sister's community um, are living in a dungeon or are raising their children in a dungeon. So it, it seems there's well, I mean, a I, I lot here sorry. that could be told in a bit different yeah. way. Well, I think you've slightly missed maybe it's because of I, I put it slightly too strongly in places. I'm not saying all religion uh, is, has these, 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 these really bad effects. Um, and I'm not saying that all America 
all Americans are fundamentally religious in, in, in any way. Um, a lot of them are much more casual about it, and, um, and it's just as a matter, it's a kind of safety precaution. They say they believe in God when Gallup asks them, because, it, you know, just in case God was listening. Um, uh, it's a bit like Pascal's wager, I suppose. But, um, uh, no, 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 but on the, but, so, but it's, so my remarks are much more directed against the ones which I think you probably agree with, against the communities which are really, really seriously restrictive, and then, but they're not small numbers. Uh, it, it, uh, not, of course, worse in other, other countries than in the United States or in, or in Europe, but where children are brought up in, in, in highly restrictive, uh, both schooling and familial environments, um, like they said, and like a lot of, increasingly, a lot of um, uh, Islamic schools. Um, I would suggest a, a lot of fundamentalists, particularly Baptist schools in the United States, and where we know what's taught in these Baptist schools. Um, it's, uh, in, they, some people escape from it, but others, um, in fact, uh, are, I think their minds are blighted. They're only going to have one life. If they don't understand and appreciate um, the wonders of the world in this life, um, they're not going to get another chance at it. And so I think uh, whenever we see this kind of uh, the blinkers being put on them, we should, we should uh, I mean, say we should forcibly remove them, as of course sounds too, 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 uh, too aggressive, but we should have uh, st structures in, power and, uh, in place and legal structures, which made it extremely difficult for that to happen. Um, it's, uh, in France, for example, uh, it, it's, you, you, faith schools of, that, of the kind I've described simply don't exist, and they're not allowed to exist. Um, and there's been a lot of criticism I, uh, in France recently, of course, about uh, issues like banning the burqa and so on. But I think the principles that lie behind it, and in fact, even in that particular case, I think the co social consequences are, in the end, entirely good. Um, to say about the, the Amish and being encouraged to go out, it's, it's, this is a, it's a relatively new thing. That came in since, since the 1960s. But the conditions under which they're encouraged to go out are... They're, they're in the, it's, it's because it's on license, because this is in a, a sense, you know, they're expected to go out and do non-Amish things order, in order partly to, to reconfirm their Amishness. Um, it's, it's actually not... It's that they're doing it too late. Yeah, well, it's not just they're doing it too late, they're doing it in a context, which, you know, if it's like uh, in, uh, uh, you know, sending someone off to sleep with a prostitute or whatever it may be, not in order to introduce them to prostitution, but in order to r remind them that actually that's not what you do. Um, it's, uh, and, in, it's, and, I, and I think, although these, and I think there may be uh, good intentions behind uh, 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 opening up the eyes of these children, they're also um, they're, they're, it, the part of the intention is to open them up to the sewer of the world out there. That, that um, My point was just that the, the story is more complicated. Yes. The picture is more complicated than. Um, sure. Yes. Well, I, I would agree with you, and I stand corrected on that. But this was partly, of course, a piece of rhetoric, and, uh, um, um, and you might, you, I might, may as well tell you that I, I received a lot of hate mail as a result of it, um, and particularly because I'd given it in the context of the amnesty lectures, um, and people thought this was somehow a betrayal of the very foundations of amnesty, but I defend it, I don't think it was. Um, by the way, I was pleased to see that amnesty has an office just around the corner here when I was out walking beside uh, Peter's house. <laughs> Does it work? It's Sorry? Just for the okay. Huh? okay. <laughs> the idea of sacrificing a little girl to the mountain gods is very strange to us, especially sin since we don't believe in mountain gods. But there are other gods today. Modern wars have killed millions of people, including many children. They were sacrificed on the modern altars of military prowess, national pride, even money, that is gold, diamonds, not to speak of oil. As I see it, the compulsory military service is the worst indoctrination we have yet practiced. Learn to kill. 
No, I, I, I agree. I, don't, I mean, children are killed in wars, not as sacrifices as such. I mean, we, we talk, I mean, of course, this, this, term, this terminology has become um, totally debased because we, we talk, about, talk about anyone who's died as having sacrificed their lives. But of course, um, they, 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 they're not, they haven't been a sacrifice. Um, in, there's no, one, no one was actually trying to do good by, by bringing, bringing the, that, that, that child's life to an end. Um, yes, I, there are all sorts of other forms of indoctrination uh, which, which of young people which are highly objectionable. And I would agree with you about uh, exposing children or exposing young people to a forced uh, service in the, in the army. The, the, it's very clear, for example, studies have been done of, of conscripts in the UDA, Israeli Defense Force, and how incredibly coarsening it is, and how it really changes them to thinking of Palestinians as, as vermin and so on. Even people who were quite liberal before. Uh, boot camp as practiced in the United States, and but uh, equally in most armies, uh, can be a highly effective form of indoctrination. I'd like to express my thanks. I was sitting here while you were um, lecturing and reflecting upon my own five children and what I have or have not done to them over the years. Uh, and I wish I'd heard your lecture before I had all five of them because there are substantial chance, changes I would have made in the way I perceive them most essentially as, uh, as individuals separated from me with their own rights, etc. So I, um, I just wanted to thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm, um, I'm rather um, nervous about what you've just said. <laughs> You'd have brought up your children differently if it's a lot of a, an hour long lecture, but anyway. <laughs> um. I was thinking about your interesting general test on how we, what we tell our children. And I was thinking about, for example, a strong atheist home where children is raised, or child is raised, and then later on in life comes to the conclusion that, well, this was actually not what I would have wanted. I, maybe it comes to conversion as soul from Tarsus. I think something. there are strong atheist families in which t t teach atheism as dogmatically as people can teach Christianity. I mean, it doesn't have to be like that. I, I and my wife are both atheists. Our ch children, of course, know that. Um, and because I, you could say that you know, that's going to bias them from the beginning because their children obviously admire their parents, at least up to a point, and want to emulate them. But um, partly because they do go to schools which tell them a lot about religion and discuss it and so on. It's, um, it's uh, in our, at least in, in, in my household, I think that, that, that the other alternatives get a good run for their money. Um, and the kids are taught to, to think about it. Um, it's, uh, but I'm, I'm quite sure there, there, there will be, I mean, the pro I'm, I'm, just I'm quite sure, I'm just trying to think if there are any atheist families who insist on pulling their children out of scripture lessons. Maybe there are, I don't know. Um, I think there's a risk of uh, abusing the word science mm -hmm. because look at a society like the Soviet Union where Lysenko's theories were science. Well, they science were. can be misused and abused. Okay. <laughs> and the closed societies like North Korea, for example, what rights do parents have there? It's the state that determines everything. I, I, I wouldn't want to defend uh, ed education in, in the China during the Cultural Revolution or North Korea now. Or, um, but uh, there are people, I think there are people who adopt the word science to, uh, as a, as a, to, give to, to uh, describe whatever their ideology is, scientific materialism, whatever it is, while not actually uh, respecting the principles of science. And so I did mean science more in the... But how do you safeguard it? Well, in, in safeguard what? The safeguard the, the, the word science so it's not misused. Uh, 
I, I suspect you can't. I mean, if people, you know, we, 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 can't, we can't. I suspected that much. Yes, um, but uh, that doesn't mean that we should, we, because others might, 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 might abuse the, 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 the term or even the, the, the ideas which we regard as scientific, I think it doesn't mean we should give up a word and a practice which has got a very venerable tradition. I mean, I think we know what we mean. <coughs> I think it's, it's common in these debates, uh, especially if one takes the viewpoint that, that you seems to, seem to be defending, that w one focuses on uh, some kind of conflict between the child and the parent, or the, the rights of the ch children versus the rights of the parents. But I think that uh, the most important thing, especially as you wanted to frame it in a liberal debate, is the conflict between the public and the private, or the individual sphere and the public sphere. And uh, you said that society grants a privilege to the parents to raise their children. I think that is not the attitude that the liberal will take. The liberal would say that uh, the parent grants a privilege to society. So society is a middleman in the child-parent relation, not that the parent is a middleman in the society-child relation. Well, I, th I, th I think you're, I mean, you're, you're, that has certainly been how it was thought about in the past, that parents did own their children. And, just, you know, uh, and so it, they didn't have any obligation to, to let the state intervene in any way at all. That would, I think, have been the traditional view. Um, probably not true, actually, if we go far enough back into hunter-gatherer societies and so on, where there's much more communal education of uh, the kind of group nursery, basically, in which the kids grow up. Um, but uh, I think that insofar as that's the view parents have about the rights of the state to intervene, they must be taught better. I mean, I, I don't think, I, do, I think the truth is that the children's welfare comes first. If a Jehovah's Witness refuses to have, let her child be immunized or be treated by modern medicine, for example, um, then what would you say? We know very, we, very well in that case, the, the, the parents can be arrested. The child is made a ward of court in Britain in that case. Um, and so in some cases, we clearly do realize that Parents are not allowed to do things to their children or to control their lives in ways which are not in the children's interests. What I'm suggesting is that, the, uh, that there's a, well, there are a lot of things which we haven't thought seriously enough about where children, parents are acting in ways which aren't in the children's interests. Um, and that applies particularly to dogmatic theology. Um, it's, it's, uh, but in, I think it depends what you, where you live. Uh, someone... I mean, I thought that actually when in Lund this lecture mightn't even seem relevant because, I mean, I say just down the road these, there are these groups who are children are being oppressed. Somebody said, well, actually, who's it? who was it here? And, um, increasingly it is a problem in, in Scandinavia because of immigrant Muslims, for example, who are demanding the right not to, to bring their children up in their ways and not to expose them to the polluting culture of, of modern Europe. So, uh, my question is just a thought I, I, I just got. Uh, you, you talk about indoctrinating children, but uh, the biggest problem nowadays uh, concerning the last uh, political issues in North Africa and all that, isn't that so that uh, children can be in indoctrinated by their parents at the very beginning, but then, the, as, as you said, then the society is taking over, and then does that, that macro the in, uh, indoctrination, which means that at some point you, uh, it's very nice to, to listen to all your arguments, but uh, uh, I think that one is prone to forget completely that liberty, the, the liberty to make a choice doesn't simply exist. It will never happen because the political situation is such mm -hmm. that all that indoctrinating is, is, is taking place now, for example. Youngsters, mm -hmm. Teenagers and uh, you know the population uh, taking part in Egypt and well you can listen to the figures uh, seventy percent of of all all those revolutionary uh, people now in uh, Egypt and so forth they are under thirty years of age which which means that anyway of course it will be best to not be uh, indoctrinated by your parents but if you don't have any, any other choice. You have your parents, you, you have to get without, that's a kind of lottery that 
Of course, if you are in a community having restraints, by all means, that is, that's a crime, and I agree with you, completely with you. But my, uh, my point of view was that, that, do you think that this is, a f of course, not scientific, but, but philosophical way of putting it, do you think that now what is happening nowadays, not only in Egypt, Tunisia, and so forth, is because of that now the indoctrinated children were more or less, let's say, lived in a kind of world that there is always a big brother upon me before it was father, then it was my big brother, and so forth. And now the big brother is that so-called democratic world which will never exist, maybe because they everybody is looking upon a kind of, say, security to go forth and to live forth. So well, my point of view is that indoctrination for own. adults doesn't, yeah. I mean, the parents start with it, but uh, mm. life is such as that, that everybody's indoctrination us, yeah, indoctrination I, 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 moves on. There are form, lots of forms of indoctrination which are uh, objectionable, um, and I wasn't in this talk trying to deal with all of them, of course, but you know, I quoted Marikovsky at the beginning, his poem, uh, the souls of madmen uh, uh, stamp the souls of madmen trample my soul with rude, crude words, whatever it was he was talking about 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 uh, Soviet Bolshevism in that case, um, so that wasn 't about religion um, but uh, what I, uh, but okay the world we 're beginning to see in most respects the world moving towards democracy i mean it is even stumbling. Uh, these sorts of, I mean, North Korea exists, of course, still, but around the rest of the world, that kind of state indoctrination at the level of politics is becoming less and less common. But at the same time, we're doing very little to control these other forms of, of indoctrination, in fact, even encouraging them um, in, because we're in the name of religious freedom. Um, and to take the case of the Egyptians or Tunisians or whatever, they... They rebelled because the state apparatus had actually not indoctrinated them. <laughs> um, it had suppressed them, but it hadn't made them think that that's the way they ought to live. Um, so basically, it was, if it had been a 1984 Orwellian situation, that kind of revolt would have been unthinkable. Um, uh, Chomsky, some time ago, there was, was remarking on a, someone on a Russian TV news broadcast, I think, had, at some point had just gone on a rant in public. Uh, uh, against the state um, and against everything which, you know, he th all the repressions which he said he'd been and his family were, ex were uh, expressing, um, had, were suffering. Um, and Chomsky said, well, you know, it's, everyone's been saying how uh, wonderful this is, but what they haven't recognized is that it couldn't have happened in America. The idea of a TV anchorman in America suddenly uh, losing their, 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 their control and, uh, and arguing against the wickedness of the American uh, 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 behavior in relation to Libya or whatever it might be, or Iraq, which just wouldn't happen. America is so tightly controlled at the level of, of news dissemination that um, it's in many ways much more of a police state than some of these other ones are. <coughs> Uh, I very much sympathize with a lot of the things that you said, but I, I, I came to think that your, um, your notion of science, uh, I think uh, that uh, should be, you speak about it in capital letters and, and you treat it as if it was just one single scientific perspective and uh, I think that there are several different scientific perspectives. We have different disciplinary perspectives, and even within disciplines, we have different perspectives and so on. And so I, I was, I, you cannot, I don't think you can dissociate the teaching of science from indoctrination absolutely as you do in, in this I, lecture. I, I don't dissociate, I, th I, I mean, I think, we can indoctrinate, indoctrination is after all teaching, we can indoctrinate scientific method. Yeah. And it's still a form of indoctrination, and it's, but it's, it's one which I defend as, as against the, <laughs> the other ones. I mean, I said at the beginning, I'm going to say, uh, in one area, I'm actually going to argue that we should be indoctrinating people. Because as, as your question yeah. about, the, about science, yeah, I, I agree. A lot of the social sciences are not sciences at all. Um, 
And it comes back to your question about what counts as science and the way in which the word, word has been adopted. Um, but I don't think there's a lot of... I mean, no, there are arguments amongst philosophers of science about the appropriate forms of reasoning to adopt in science, etc. But you know, they, they don't touch the central issue of, 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 of whether or not truths established by this particular method are more reliable, more likely to serve your interests, and more likely to lead to better new ideas in the future than alternative ways of, of gaining knowledge, which in fact just simply don't have that kind of uh, philosophical or rational basis. Did I hear you right when you, say, uh, when you said that uh, social sciences are not science? Oh, so that I think that some of them are remarkably lacking in science. Sociology has not been doing too well in in, uh, as a science, but um, uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> are you a sociologist? <laughs> Close to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, it, it tries. To, I mean, they, 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 they try to emulate science. I just think they've not very often been very good at it. Um, In the 70s, uh, there was the practice of sterilization in Sweden. And one of the most uh, famous uh, Swedish um, uh, national uh, economist, uh, Gunnar Myrdal, he was actually in favor of this practice. It, it was when, when uh, and, and his reason for this was strictly economical you could suspect that he had some racial ideology in the background, but, but in the, in the uh, 50s, uh, it was... In the uh, 30s, 36 it was. Yeah, yeah but, but, but uh, uh, that was a uh, scientific perspective of the day that, that certain well, uh, it wasn't. It wasn't. groups in society, they should not have children, so we better sterilize them. Well, I mean, you said scientific because he was using scientific theories and even potentially scientific methods to carry out what he thought would be the, uh, the right uh, uh, procedures to, to, to move on to because of the conclusions he drew. He didn't do research on sterilization to see what the effects would be. He didn't actually examine you know, uh, in an empirical uh, way if we take, compare this, uh, this, this procedure with that procedure, which actually produces a better outcome for society or for the health of our, of, of, our, of our community or whatever it might be. So it wasn't science. I mean, I agree science uh, does have a lot of meanings, but I, w I hoped I was using it, I tried to define it even in the end, as a method of inquiry, um, not as a method, method of, not as a technology or as a, or as a particular set of conclusions. Mm. Uh, I just want to thank you for all the four le lectures you've been having. Amazingly interesting, every one of them. Um, uh, I don't actually have a question, just a remark for today's uh, lecture. And uh, I know you studied in Cambridge, so I just want to say that maybe some of the things, a lot of those things you said today could be found in um, Monty Python's uh, Life of Brian. I don't know <laughs> if you disagree or agree with me. Yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, in fact, there's, there's a wonderful sketch, and I can't remember the name of the text, but they, ha they, they, have, they adopt precisely these, these uh, self-limiting ways of, of, of making yourself quite certain that, that, that nobody actually gets hold of any alternative ideas, and then they begin to split and so on. And Oh, I'd forgotten that. Just a remark. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.